Welcome to the monthly truck stop brought to you by the Motor Carriers Insurance Education Foundation. These are for members only, and they start on at, at second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars presented as industry updates for information purposes only and do not qualify state CE credit. We do have numbers of programs that do qualify for state CE credit, so visit our website if you need state CE credit. If you have any questions, type them in the chat window. They'll be answered as time allows, or usually by email afterwards. If you experience any audio problems, then please call our office at 800-741-484, or type in the chat window, and we'll try to correct those things as soon as possible. Cargo liability and role of insurer. Recent developments. Uh, when you win a court case, when a lawyer wins a court case, you try to publish this. And I think that our friend, uh, firm Jay Taylor, who's often, and Christina Johnson, who's a partner in that firm, won a good case talking about uh, the cargo, and particularly damage and things that involve the human consumption that makes things a little differently. So we asked her today to not only explain this court case, but maybe help me explore some things that will help us look at not only coverage, but when something happens to inform our driver to uh, uh, to take certain actions. Good morning or good afternoon, I mean, excuse me. Uh, my time frame doesn't work here. How are you? And give them a couple of minutes or about you and all, and then we'll take, take over this, okay? All right. Thank you very much, Tommy. Um, I am Kristen Johnson. I am a partner at Taylor Johnson and work on our dispute resolution litigation practice. We had um, a very long, three-year-long case uh, that I'm here to talk to you about today. But before I get into that, just wanted to give you a little bit of background about what I do at the firm. Uh, if it is a dispute, if it goes to court, arbitration, mediation, negotiation, and even settlement discussions, uh, that, that usually lands on my desk at the firm. A large portion of my practice is specific to freight and cargo claims. I would say at least a third. At least a third of my practice is dedicated to that. We are a transportation firm, so all we do is transportation law, but as you know, Transportation companies are businesses, so there's a whole lot of law that goes into it. My other work is contract disputes, tort disputes, you know, non-competes, the whole nine yards, insurance coverage, we do all of that. But cargo and freight claims are, are a large part of it. Um, so today, go ahead. No, that's important to us because when we look at cases, we hear all these news articles about nuclear verdicts and all that, and a lot of times we ignore the cargo part, and in reality, uh, the kinds of risks that most of the audience writes, which is less than 20 power units of uh, common people, the cargo claim is far more important to them than a nuclear verdict, uh, this part of it, because most of the time they'll be involved in the liability and the defense and all that. But cargo, because I've always taught that cargo is the most important coverage because it upsets the relationship of our trucker with their customer. And so yeah. you have to be careful walking through this part of it, and we ignore some of the things. And the, some of the principles that you had in the article that we read with it was CCJ Magazine, I think, that was involved in it back in yeah. September that wrote this case up and gave us here. will give us some insight on maybe helping our insureds talk, to, excuse me, our agents to talk to the insureds about these important things. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here today to talk to your audience in particular because I think insurance agents play a big role in this and you're right tommy these aren't necessarily bet the company cases like your nuclear verdicts uh but these are the cases that make or break your profitability and if you're paying these out all the time or if you get into a dispute where gee you know it's in the high or mid six figures it's a lot of money and you don't want to lose that customer because it's a huge revenue source for for you what do you do about it well that's why you have to be really delicate in handling these and that's why these are so important to the bottom line so i i think it's really important to be able to understand the legal lanes landscape right away when you have a cargo claim and to be able to set back step back and assess evaluate is this a claim i want to fight or is this a claim i want to you know pay my customer and turn around and fight or you know from the carrier's perspective is it is it is it a claim where 
um, I want to admit liability or when I want to put my foot down and say, no, I'm not responsible for this one um, and I'm not going to pay this one. And insure, you know, as you know, insurers have a lot of, have a very big role to play in that. Um, all right, let me move the slides forward. Here are the four most common cargo liability scenarios that I face uh, in my practice. One is where the cargo is damaged in transit or there's an accident. Pretty common, that was, um, that was the situation here. Uh, it wasn't an accident, but it was purportedly damaged in transit. And I'll get into the facts of this case because it's really important to understand the facts. I'll get into those in just a second, but I'm, I'm just giving you an overview of like when you might have cargo liability issues come up. Uh, it can be upon rejection by a receiver for any reasons. Maybe it was damaged in transit. The receiver sees that and they say, nope, I'm not accepting it. It could be latent damage where it's uncovered after the fact. They had a copper case recently where it was accepted by the receiver um, and they opened up the boxes and it looked like the boxes that, actually, that contained copper got wet in transit. And so the copper was, was very seriously damaged uh, in transit, but you couldn't see it until you opened the boxes, which had dried at that point, interestingly. Uh, and then lost and stolen cargo, deal with that a lot. When I get calls, I, usually usually it's way after the fact. Um, I always like to say, call your lawyer early. <laughs> if you can, if you, if you have a good relationship with Transportation Council and you think it's a sticky situation and you're not quite sure what to do about it, you're deciding whether to reject the claim or pay out the claim, but you're really not certain about who is responsible for it, I would say, you know, get on the phone and, and talk to a lawyer about it for a little bit because you might be surprised. I think this case I'm going to cover will surprise a lot of you. Uh, and so I want you to hear the facts of this case to understand how, gee, maybe I, maybe, maybe I have an analogous situation. Maybe I should find out actually who is responsible for the damaged cargo. I'll tell you one thing, it's not always the carrier. Uh, and the carrier can be responsible. The carrier is often responsible. There is a legal scheme, as you all have heard probably way too many times, the Carmack Amendment puts the puts responsibility for cargo damage liability on the carrier most of the time, but not all of the time. So that is a big question, is who is responsible for this? Let me hmm? make a suggestion here. Sometimes hmm. this gets to the agent because what happens is the insurance companies get involved in and they have either a reservation rights letter or, or get involved in it. And so the trucker then calls the agent because that's who is being pressured uh, by the shipper is to pay, not mm -hmm. the insurance company, but the broker or the, or the shipper would do that. And so the agent calls up and calls up a lot of times for me. And we have referred a number of these to you, your firm that walked through that, but that's a, Good service uh, of, that, that your firm has. Uh, Johnson Taylor has. Uh, Taylor Johnson has. Uh, I always got to put Jay's name first. <laughs> Taylor Johnson uh, has helped us in those areas just to walk through these things to give some at least counsel to 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 at least let them know the lay of the land. And I think, and also you're absolutely right. A lot of people have heard about Carmack, and this is a great example of a of the Carmack case that's in, involved in it here. So go ahead. I just want to mention that you getting involved, at least giving thoughts about how to handle it or where to go with it is important and it's an important service that your firm has provided yeah. to members of the foundation. Yeah, well, thank you. And we we have, I mean, we've seen so many of these, it doesn't take us very long to focus in on the issues. I mean, everything, every situation is different. The one I'm gonna cover is a really wacky situation, but you know, we're so used to dealing with wacky situations that we can focus in on the issues quickly. And if there is a true question, about who's responsible or what the amount of damages are, which is the number two call I receive. Um, I can usually, if you give me the, the facts of your scenario and the shipping documents, it doesn't take more than an hour to go figure that out, at least from a preliminary assessment. Um, but unfortunately, usually when I get the cargo claims, uh, much time has passed. <laughs> Uh, very rarely am I involved in the beginning. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I am, especially with long established clients where they know, okay, this one really might go awry. Let's get lawyers involved right away. Um, it, even if you don't get a lawyer involved right away, if, if you're an agent and you're getting a call from a carrier, I, I know you've been told this before, but I'm going to say it again. Document everything. Document everything. If you can take pictures, take pictures. You, can, you know, you don't waste film anymore. So just take pictures of everything 
get you know reports if you can get them on the spot get inspections if they're happening because if you don't and the days go by you can't go back and recreate that stuff so all all that information you get at the time of any incident uh is so helpful and if if you as an agent have to give one piece of advice to your insured when they call you is to get the details get the names get the phone numbers if you're at a receiving dock and someone's rejecting your load get the name and phone number of that person so we know who to call so we know who rejected it in the case i'm about to cover we actually didn't know the identity of all of the people that were at the receiving dock that rejected it and neither did the broker who ultimately brought the case and so they didn't have a key witness which was the person who even live inspected the goods upon arrival because that information wasn't wasn't taken down by anyone. Uh, so it comes to me and a lot of times all the actions have been taken and all that's left is a lawsuit. So I would like to talk to you about a lawsuit today of pretty great importance throughout the United States, of key importance in the state of Florida because that's where the case was decided it was decided in a federal court for the Middle District of Florida by Judge Badlamenti. It's the case of Scotland USA Division versus Titan Trans. Uh, we represented the carrier in this case, and Scotland USA is a broker, uh, and they they brought this case on behalf of the shipper. Um, the case, even though it's controlling in Florida, it still has implications throughout the United States. Uh, a lot of us transportation lawyers, we pay attention when you get a decision like this one. This was a 59 page opinion by this judge. Um, it was not small by any means and it gave a lot of guidance. The judge really did an excellent job in my view of diving into the Carmack Amendment, to the exceptions of the Carmack Amendment, to um, a carrier and a broker's obligation to mitigate damages. Um, and a whole slew of things that we kind of deal with on a daily basis. And so it's like a per it's a perfect case study in a nutshell. In this case, the 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 basic details, um, let me actually move forward. Here we go. All right, so the players, because I'm gonna drop some names, I want to make sure you know who I'm talking about. Motor carriers, Titan Trans, Shipper. Uh, the goods here are is it's raw beef, it's uh, beef trim that's in these large containers called combos. I'll get into that in a second. But uh, the shipper was FPL Foods. It was shipping to Cargill, which is a meat process processor, and the broker was Scotland USA. There was also a cargo, cargo insurer involved in this case that was assisting my client um, and that we regularly worked with during the course of the case and actually did a very good job handling the case at the outset. Very interestingly, the insurer's view on this um, which was to deny coverage. Um, they denied coverage pretty quickly, I think within about 30 days of the incident. And many of the reasons that the insurer cited for its denial ended up being ultimately what the court found three years later. That's so, good. Pretty good, yeah, insurer doing a good job there. Uh, all right, the raw facts. I am gonna have some uh, beef related humor in this presentation because if you can't have fun then what are you doing um so the raw facts on this one <laughs> was that titan trans transported 21 combos of beef those are large cardboard corrugated uh corrugated board boxes that are open on top there's uh there's flats on the bottom that interlock and then there's plastic lining inside of that and the beef is put into that lining it was about um, two tons of beef per combo, and the trailer was loaded with 21 of those combos, which were staggered. Um, sounds kind of boring to know how it was loaded, but it actually turned out to be a key fact in this case because the combos were loaded onto the trailer by the shipper FPL. The driver backed up to the dock, and as many of you are probably familiar with, in a refrigerated and sanitary condition, the driver doesn't usually do anything with the loading. So the shipper took responsibility for this, put it all onto the trailer and um, off the driver went. Interesting fact here, if you like to get into the nitty gritty of it, is that this bill of lading was not marked shipper loading count. Um, very common in the industry to see that. It's I would say it's standard practice to see shipper loading count. And the one thing I would like to say to you is that it's not required that a bill of lading be marked shipper loading count for it to actually have been shipper loading count. 
what what it comes down to is what in fact was true now we uh, i strongly recommend the drivers to write that down because it cannot hurt <laughs> and yeah. it gives a starting point uh to that part of it and that way it opens the question what were you actually doing driver well i couldn't see they wouldn't let me in the dock i mean you know all these other kind of things so it, yeah. it highlights that part and the very part of it so even though it might not be a requirement because you boil down to the facts no matter what whatever you mm -hmm. write you at least knowledge up front that I did not see it because again that's a part of Carmack is to prove that you re they received it in good condition the driver and the only way that I say that the the shipper verifies that is when the driver signs the receipt and so yeah. to make any kind of notation on the receipt that the driver did not know the condition or the count would be helpful in the long run. It's good oh, they didn't absolutely. have to do this because y'all did a great job walking around it. But I yeah. think you would agree with me, it would have helped. Or it would oh, not yeah. have harmed, but probably have helped uh, and, and taken, maybe saved you an hour or two that we didn't have to pay for later. Uh, yeah, I say an hour <laughs> or 10. Uh, we had. <laughs> you, <won't laughs> we <hear definitely>, <laughs> you know, and the, bro the broker uh, who brought the case was, was would it, did the same thing I would have done had I been in their shoes. Which is argued, hey, it doesn't shape, say shipper load and count, so it's not shipper load and count. And we had a whole litigation over that issue, uh, and so it did become it did become contentious. Interestingly, the driver here didn't speak English, uh, so that could have been part of the issue as to why he didn't write that. Maybe he wasn't familiar with the, you know, with the process or didn't know what to write. But sometimes there are reasons why your bill of lading might not have shipper load and count notated. And for those of you that like hard and fast rules, I'm sorry, don't look at the bill of lading and say, oh, it doesn't say shipper load and count. So it's definitely on the carrier. That's my only piece of advice on this one. It, it's most likely on the carrier, but it, you still got to look at it. And in a situation like this, it was relatively easy to show that it was shipper load and count because these are giant combos of beef that have to be loaded on by forklift in an area where obviously, especially with food, you know, for sanitary reasons, the driver would never be allowed to to handle any of that. Um, so that was a, it was a relatively easy one to to prove it. But yes, Tommy, you are right. Get that bill of lading marked. Make your notations on it. Have the drivers making notations. I, people are afraid to write things on bills of lading. Uh, well, the bill of lading is the number one document in any of my cargo freight claim cases. Number cargo one. Contract transit. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, you know it. it it is it's your it's your contract of carriage and right, yeah there's going to be and in this case we had a, a a broker motor carrier agreement that governed the terms between the broker and the motor carrier and to an extent it may have governed some of the liability but ultimately uh, there is liability for that shipment and the parties who are responsible for that shipment and who have the rights to bring claims under that uh, or for that shipment those are the ones that are on the bill of lading. And so the bill of lading is an incredibly important legal document. And if something is wrong, or if you need to note something about the shipment, that's where you do it. I uh, can't, can't emphasize that enough. All right, so back to this shipment, we have our driver from Titan Trans leaving Georgia and heading to Wisconsin. He says, uh, in, in translated depositions, that no unusual events occurred. No hard breaking was reported during transit. He doesn't remember a thing. Also, this case took many, many years to litigate. So again, you talk about your facts getting stale. You got a driver who's, you know, how many loads has he, has he delivered? You know, and he's trying to remember three years prior of one load. Who knows what happened with that load? But at the end of the day, there was nothing that the plaintiff, the broker in this case, could show that indicated there was anything wrong with the way the driver was delivering this load, except, except the state of the combos upon arrival, which is pretty big proof that something happened. I'm going to show you a picture. I hope you all can see that. Pictures say a thousand words. Uh, this is an exhibit, so I'm not showing you anything confidential here. This was an exhibit in the trial, but you can see what happened here. This, this load arrived and these combos had shifted. At least some of the combos had shifted. One that you see right on the front, perfectly fine standing up. You can see what I'm talking about, the way that they're positioned on the trailer. Um, but you can see one has definitely rolled forward. And I'll scroll forward to another picture. Here's a better picture, kind of an overhead picture that shows 
several of them had moved uh, forward to toward the nose of the trailer. Hard to tell from these pictures if all the way to the back, uh, I think you can see my mouse there, if all the way to the back, if these had shifted, um, if they had shifted forward, you know, maybe the driver would have felt it. Uh, it was actually indicated by an expert on loading shipments like this into containers that it was very likely there was a gap at the nose of the trailer um, that contributed to these combos shifting forward because there was space for them to shift forward. They weren't supporting one another. Um, and so it's it's very possible there was a gap there. Um, and we see that in the way that they want to run. Let me ask two questions I got here. First off, and some of the meat was exposed, right? Uh, no, besides. we don't know. No inspection, oh. no testimony. Oh, really? Okay. So just because of this happened is, is where they had a problem. The second part of, you know, we have talked about these new apps now. They're tuck on the truck to show hard braking and curving and all this vent recorders and all that. If that was available, would that have hurt you if you show something and or helped you if that did not? Well, obviously something happened to cause these combos to tip forward. So I don't know if it would have helped me or hurt me. Uh, frankly, someone had to apply some brake pressure at some time. Right. But I think the judge noted in his order, I'm pretty sure he noted this, simply because you have to push the brakes hard doesn't mean you did something negligent or right. that your driving was reckless. And so that came into play when we, and I'll get into it in a minute, when we talk about one of the exceptions to the Carmack Amendment, that was something that the court considered. So whether there, if there was an ELD on, on this particular truck, I think it would have shown, you know, was there excessive hard braking or was there one incident of hard braking? Was this right. someone who was just really heavy on, on both the pedals, you know, the entire time or not? And I think that would have influenced maybe the initial discussions in this case, uh, but, but no one knew. And the only thing we knew is that these combos had shifted forward. Uh, there were only, I believe, I could be wrong, I don't remember, nine photographs, something like that, nine or ten photographs. I'm, you know, we finish a trial and we erase all these facts from our memories as lawyers because they're so full during trial with every single little detail that it's like, whoosh, <laughs> we're done. So I think there were like nine, nine photographs, but that's all we had. We didn't have an inspection. We didn't have any, you know, any pulping. We didn't have anyone observe uh, leakage from these combos um you can see the, in the in the photographs and there are more photographs i and i don't have them all today but you know people were looking at the floor which was pictured in one of the photographs saying ah oh, it kind of looks like maybe there was some leakage here but it's really hard to know if that was um a puncture in any of these combos or not and at the end of the day if you bring a lawsuit, if a, if a broker or a shipper brings a lawsuit against a carrier, they have a basic burden of proof, which is they have to show that there was damage to the goods in order to recover under Carmack, which was a, a pretty key thing that this judge noted when he ultimately rendered his opinion in our favor. Because there wasn't a good inspection and all we had were a handful of photographs, the broker had a very difficult time proving their case because they didn't have anyone, not even a live witness. Like I said, we they didn't know who, who was at the receiving dock who rejected this. So they didn't have a live witness to be able to say, well, I observed it. I could see puncture wounds. There was beef spilling out, all this stuff, nothing. All they had was photographs. All right. So the timeline is kind of a fun one. And I'm I'm bringing up this level of detail because as an insurance agent, if you're handling something like this and you get a call from your insured, you probably are going to find out, okay, what has happened and when has it happened? And in this particular case, we see that the combos were shifted upon arrival. Cargo looked at them, rejected them. And then what happens after that? And one of the things that's really important in this particular case is after a load has been rejected, Whose responsibility is that? Uh, and in this in this case, the broker argued, well, it was the carrier's responsibility to continue to handle this meat. In fact, it was not. It was the broker's responsibility at that point in time. If the broker had retendered it to the carrier to bring back, maybe there was some more responsibility on the part of the carrier. But at that point, they would be accepting a shifted load of beef 
to bring back, not a beef, you know, standing and a non-shifted condition, whether it's in damaged condition is to be determined. But anyway, the, the, the timeline is really important in this one. So let me ask you a question. When you say yep. broker, the same thing would happen if the shipper had, if you, if you didn't have a broker and deal directly with the shipper, either one, right? Correct. And in fact, it, if it was the shipper that was telling the broker to do this, ultimate responsibility would have been on the shipper That's or directing it. Like shipper, or broker, whoever that person was gave direction. Once it was there, it became their responsibility to then talk about what to do with it. That's what I was right. saying. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And in this case, it was a broker that was responsible and was directing it, but it could be either of them. Right. And in fact, I mean, we weren't making a claim, right? It wasn't, we were just defending a claim. So if, if hypothetically someone were making a claim, I don't know why they would be, but if they're making a claim, hey, you mishandled this, after rejection they may bring that claim against the broker or they may bring that claim against the shipper or maybe both of them if the broker is acting on behalf of the shipper also depends on what their contract says all right so let me just cover this very quickly wednesday september 21st 2016 so this is an old case right it was picked up in georgia takes two days to get to wisconsin it arrives september 23rd between 12 and 1 p.m waits a couple hours cargo opens the trailer you see those pictures I showed you, those pictures were snapped, Cargill rejects the load. That's it, no USDA inspection, nothing rejects it due to the fact that it was sh shifted. In the evening that same day, the broker tries to get the driver to return to Georgia. The, 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 carrier, couldn't, the carrier couldn't do it because the driver was out of hours and the broker says, okay, hold on, I'll tell you what to do. They go back and forth a little bit. And finally, the broker asks the carrier and the carrier agrees, all right, I'll bring it back Monday the 26th. They're gonna hold it in a refrigerated state until then. On the morning of September 26th, the carrier has this beef still in the truck, uh, starts to head back. Like an hour later, barely an hour later, the broker tells, the shipper and FPL, there was a bunch of emails where people were kind of on the emails together or stuff was getting forwarded back and forth. Hey, the carrier is leaving. They're going to arrive in a day or so. That was the first time that Cargill and FPL learned that the beef hadn't left on Friday and that the beef was leaving on Monday to go back. That weekend time was really critical for a beef processor who says, whoa, whoa, the beef in that trailer has a shelf life. If you'd sent it back to FPL that Friday, we could have reprocessed it. Maybe we would have lost some value, but we could have repackaged it, repurposed it, used it for dog food, whatever. We could have mitigated our damages. But now we can't take it back. It's too old. And they said, don't bother taking it back. So the broker goes, okay, <laughs> now I have a carrier driving around with a load of beef and no one's going to take it back. So the broker says to the carrier, it's your problem. Total loss. Can't take it back. You keep the beef, we're out. Uh, that's basically what the broker says. If anyone wants to read a recap of the facts, it is in the opinion of the judge. And I can I can provide that to you, Tommy, after the fact, if you want to circulate it. But I'm summarizing here what the court has found as facts in the case. So anyway, at that point, the carrier calls their insurer and says, hey, I have a total loss. It's sitting in my trailer. I need to figure out what to do with it. The insurer helps out. They work on salvaging and they get about $5,000 in salvage for this load. The load was valued at $90,000. So very little in salvage, but they do salvage it. Interestingly, when they salvaged it, this is another uh, thing that I think the insurance agents should pay attention to. If you have a load that gets salvaged, when they salvaged it, the carrier, actually in this case, it was a small carrier. So the owner of the carrier went and was physically present when they transloaded the beef onto another trailer for the salvager. So he was able at that point to be an eyewitness to the state of the beef. And he was the only eyewitness that we had in the case as to the state of the beef. So if you didn't get an inspection in the beginning, but some event happens down the road, particularly if you're salvaging, you can use that as an opportunity to go and take pictures. If, if for whatever reason the carrier is stuck with abandoned cargo, 
they should fully document whatever that cargo looks like. I think that's really important. And as an as an insurance agent, if you're trying to decide what you're going to do with it and what it looks like and what the value is, were there actual damages, was it a correct rejection, et cetera, you can have your you can have your driver or your carrier go and document the whole thing, or you could send someone to go inspect. Don't forget you can do that. All right. Let me move to the next slide. All right, after it is all rejected, it's salvaged, the broker makes a demand on the carrier for payment, the carrier tendered the demand to the insurer, and the insurer denied for two reasons. One, failure to mitigate damages, and shipper responsibility. So it goes to court, and then I get involved. I mentioned before, and this is some more of my humor here. Oh, we changed it. We changed the title. Uh, I, I oh. said that the broker failed to meet its burden of proof, M-E-A-T, and someone tried to correct me. <laughs> Marcia will do that. She didn't get the meat puns. That's okay. It's fine. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, broker standing in the shoes of the shipper uh, has, a res has a responsibility if they're going to bring a case in court to make their case. And obviously they brought a Carmack, uh, Carmack liability case. They also brought a breach of contract case. Generally speaking, if you're only talking about damage to goods and carrier liability, that is going to be governed by the Carmack amendment and not by a broker carrier agreement. It is possible in certain circumstances to argue that there were separate damages that were incurred due to a breach of a contract. That's something I look at a lot. But if you're just talking about payment for the underlying loss to goods, that's a Carmack amendment claim. For the most part, now you all know there's exceptions and you know food is one of those things, but in this case, this beef fell under Carmack. Uh, all right, so co common scenario under the Carmack Amendment is that the carrier is liable. There are some exceptions though, and the exceptions can be either full relief from liability, which is where the shipper is responsible, which was a finding in this case, or it could be your liability is limited for some reason. Maybe there's a contract that has a limitation of liability provision. One thing we look at a lot for our insurance clients is we will look at layers of contracts. We will say, okay, you have an agreement with the broker. Maybe there's no limitation of liability in there. Maybe there is, but, but does the broker have an agreement with the shipper? Does that contain a limitation of liability? And for some reason, could that apply here? And there are a lot of situations where we can see limitations of liability flowing upstream and downstream. Uh, a lot of times shippers have tariffs or things published on their websites that say there's a limitation of liability for all shipments. And so oftentimes it can be the case that a carrier, it, is the beneficiary of a limitation of liability in one of those contracts along the line. So that's something that I really like to look at because that can be a hidden way to save a whole lot of money in a cargo claim. We make a suggestion, particularly when you get a loan from a broker who has no idea in a lot of cases what things are worth, to at least put on there, I'm not responsible any more than what the limits you require me to have. Because even if you don't have enough limits and even they require 100,000, if it's worth 150,000, the shipper of the motor carrier is still responsible for it uh, without something like that. So we at least suggest that they put on there, I'm not responsible for more than what you asked me to insure it for. Yeah, uh, and you, you can put that in your agreement with your and broker. Your mm -hmm. You can put on your bill of lading too. If right. and, and if you have a question about it, I will say carriers are generally charged with responsibility of knowing about the freight that they're carrying. And so, if there's a question when you go to pick up a load, uh, you should find out what the weight is or what the declared value is and make sure that if there were some sort of accident or loss to those goods that you have the correct coverage for that or don't take the load. Uh, you know, you're not required as a carrier to go get the load. If someone's asking you to get a $400,000 load of seafood and you only have $200,000 coverage for reefer breakdowns, you might want to stop before you pick up that load because you're going to get hit with the remainder of it if, you're, if your insurance doesn't cover it. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty important to know um, if there's any limitation of liability anywhere along the way. 
I also will comment on this, beware of battle of forms. Um, sometimes you have situations where there are more than one bill of lading and one of the bills of lading may have a release in it or a limitation of liability. Uh, make sure that you're looking at the bill of lading as if you're the carrier that you you see a bill of lading that is issued to you or that you issue upon pickup of the goods and that that bill of lading has the correct liability statement in it if there is one or if there is none then make sure you have an agreement with the broker or shipper that hired you that says what your limitation of liability is write it on the bill of lading uh, something along those lines otherwise you might get stuck with the whole thing um, all right Another thing to ask is mitigation of damages. Once there is an accident, uh, has the carrier done everything they can to mitigate the damages and has the receiver done what they can to mitigate the damages? Uh, in this situation, when you have a load of beef that is delivered to the receiver, delivery is complete when the receiver accepts the goods or when the receiver receives the goods and then rejects them. Once you have tendered the goods to the receiver, your delivery is technically complete and the receiver has a responsibility if they're going to kick that load, the receiver has a responsibility to mitigate damages. If that receiver could have done something, and, and this really bothered the judge in this particular case, if that receiver could have done something, they probably should have. It's a lot of money and a lot of waste to just say, oh, it's shifted, not my problem. And a couple interesting things came up here, Tommy. We started talking about this before the show, but uh, you know, one of the arguments that came up in the court case was, well, Food Safety Modernization Act. You see a bunch of beef that's arrived shifted like that. Doesn't the doesn't the receiver have some kind of responsibility under food safety modernization to say no to that shipment? Um, and I, I would I would caution receivers there, and you know, to the extent that insurance agents are looking at that the food safety modernization act just says that you can't put contaminated food into the stream of commerce and you need to and there are some rules relating to transportation specifically but it doesn't say if you guess that there might be contamination that that gives you grounds to take an action that in all context is unreasonable and so yeah there might have been food safety modernization questions in this particular case but if there wasn't an inspection no usda you know in this case the beef company they have usda inspector on site he can come look at it he or she can come look at it um you know there's no inspection there's no visuals of open bags there's no visuals of punctures or of beef spilling out there's no visuals of contamination there wasn't an issue with refrigeration. And so the broker arguing here in the shoes of the shipper was never able to show that the Food Safety Modernization Act formed a basis for the denial or the rejection of the goods. Does that make sense? Um, now, I was actually surprised on the pictures of what you just said. I thought when I first read the article you wrote, there could have been some meat that fell on one of them on the ground and there was one or two things, but obviously they didn't even have that. <laughs> and yeah, there was the a picture suspicion. You here. Yeah, there was a suspicion. Which I would that, think, you know, you could argue one of the combines were maybe damaged, but not all of them. But uh, mm -hmm. in this case, right. you didn't, they didn't even have that. Right, and and yeah, and, and and if one of them had spilled open, well, what about the other twenty? Right, yeah, that that yeah, that would be that would be the argument here. But in this case, there wasn't even any of it right. that they could have right. shown. And even, and if you look at the way, we had to bring experts in to talk about them, but the way that these combos are structured, it's it's not a tight seal. So if if one of those cardboard containers shifts forward, it's very possible that some kind of liquid could leak out, but that doesn't mean that contaminants have gone into the meat. Yeah, right. uh, that, you know, probably they're designed that way for air circulation, I don't know, um, or just ease of use when you, you're you dealing with a forklift on, on receipt. But at the end of the day, you still have to show that you have a reasonable basis to believe that Food Safety Modernization Act would apply and would stop you from um, using that. Yeah, you know, and it all comes down to judgment and judgment calls by the receivers. But I will, I will simply caution that Food Safety Modernization is not carte blanche to say 
to reject to reject shipments or to behave in an unreasonable manner. And in this particular situation, the court found that was not that was not a basis for rejection here, and there was not sufficient proof of it. Again, we're talking about burden of proof. When you're oh, in a I civil case, it's it's so when you're in a civil case, you to meet your burden of proof, you just have to show greater than 51% chance. You don't have to show like beyond a, a reasonable doubt or anything like in those criminal cases. So this is what the court found, but every situation might be different and you know people are going to argue one way or the other. Uh, and it, so the other thing was on mitigation that we kind of just touched on a little bit, Tommy, is what it, why would you reject the whole trailer full of beef when you can see at least one of them is standing up i mean if they're if they're 4500 bucks a pop right why are we going to reject the whole thing on shifting and so that was something else that bothered the court which is there was no attempt to try to salvage or mitigate your damages it was just a full rejection a full rejection now of course the shipper thought at that point it was going to go back to fpl and be reprocessed so maybe that was a reasonable thing for the shipper to do even that would be cost cost prohibitive in that case because you got another couple thousand dollars worth of transportation involved in it but yeah you know, i just it just would screw up on that end and but i love this next one shipper responsibility shipper errors what how we teach that negligence of the shipper and that gets back to who loaded it right yes yes uh and that that was a critical finding of the court here was that at the end of the day there is an exception to the carmack amendment that says if it's a shipper, if the shipper has taken responsibility for loading, packing, loading, securing the shipment, then if something happens during transit that relies on that packing or relies on the securing of the shipment, it's that that shipper took responsibility for it. And you have to show that the carrier wasn't negligent. So th that's important too, right? If you have a carrier that's being crazy, you know, they're doing something that that by all means would be negligent, even if the shipper did take responsibility for it, still the carrier's fault. But in this particular case, the court said, well, again, the broker didn't meet their burden of proof. They didn't show greater than 51% chance that the carrier was negligent. And we showed, because we had, we, the burdens shift back and forth between the parties during the case. But as a defendant, the carrier showed that the shipper had taken responsibility for loading this. Kind of covered this already, but failure to sh to prove your damages can be a fatal fatal mistake. Uh, there was a failure to inspect here. There was no proof of actual damage. There was a question in the case of when the damage occurred, because was the damage due to the shifting of the beef, or was the damage due to that timeline I talked about, where the shelf life of the beef uh, became a critical issue after the broker did not have it sent back for several days. And what was the amount of damages? This is all something that the plaintiff in a cargo case has to show. Uh, be very careful when the shipper loads and secures. If you mess with the bull, you could get the horns. Shippers can definitely be responsible. If a broker pays that claim to the shipper and turns around and brings the lawsuit, the broker's the one that's going to get stuck with that responsibility if they can't prove their case. Um, and you had on enough brokers to know that a lot of times the broker is to keep the shipper happy, will take that responsibility. And that leaves us a problem with the insurance part of this because the owner of the property is who we have to deal with because it's a legal liability contract. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I always far out before you ever make any settlement discussion with a broker, you need to make sure the shipper has given that broker responsibility for that part and released you of liability for dealing with the, the broker. Sometimes you have that dual mm -hmm. conflict. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you want to make sure that if you settle out with the broker, you're actually settling out with everyone that could bring the claim. Um, and and I would say here, I make the point of never assume. I just mean never assume who's responsible. Uh, you know, one thing that we noted about this case was that the broker took a really hard line stance. The carrier is responsible. The carrier is responsible for all of this, including what happened to the beef after the fact, um, after the after the rejection. And that was, I think it turned out to be a wrong assumption on the part of the broker. Um, they 
the court found that the broker carried some level of responsibility here, and then the court held the broker to that level of responsibility. Uh, this goes into failing to mitigate damages. The broker actually made the situation worse um, because the broker was not aware of the shelf life issues. The carrier was also not aware of the shelf life issues, but it was ultimately the broker's responsibility and faster action would have happened. The meat wasn't totally worthless when it arrived at Cargill, but it was rendered practically worthless by the time that the, um, the shipment started heading back toward Georgia. All right, takeaways. Everyone likes some takeaways and I want to leave everyone with very practical advice. Uh, number one, always determine the amount of loss or damage. Uh, I've seen plenty of situations and, and by the way, I've been on both sides of this. You know, we work with a lot of insurers and we work with a lot of brokers, work with a lot of shippers um, and you got to look objectively at it. What is the actual amount of damage? One of the key mistakes in this case was assuming that it was a full loss when it arrived at Cargill in a shifted form. You made a comment earlier to me or in your article that I read that this broker didn't even know what the shipment was worth, how much damage that they were trying to claim. Um, yeah, the broker the broker did not know at the time of receipt with cargo how much damage had right. been incurred to that meat. Um, and that's one of the Carmack pillows of responsibility is they've got to say what the damages are. Yeah, and the court was very emphatic about that. The judge said, look, broker, I might find, he actually found that there was damage. He said, if if the shipment arrives in the shifted state, that's different than the good condition it was tendered in. That's damage. How much damage? Is it a hundred bucks? Because you have to hire an extra forklift driver for an hour or two to help you unload it? Is it four thousand five hundred dollars because one of those combos is significantly damaged and maybe contaminated or is it the whole truckload and the court said i can't i can't tell because i don't have enough information in front of me to know how much was actually damaged at the time of receipt um but and that that was very big that was a very big issue for the judge in this and case the reason i brought that up because if they get back to what you said in the opening this is where the driver needs to document everything. The driver should have or could have taken pictures, found out the people involved in it, know that this stuff wasn't done. That will help you later to defend the case if mm -hmm. they come up with some valuations or some damages that are beyond what is reasonable and actually there. Because yeah. we're in a position to pay for the damages that were done. We just don't want to pay for things that weren't done. That would have been that case. In this case, we also have the shipper error factor involved in it too, but you got two problems here. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want to limit your liability no matter what and the second part of it by showing what was damaged or not damaged you also have to we got this other one that ship error is a part of it also yeah yeah so this opinion like i said it's very long the court found all right you know even if you had proven some level of damages and he he found none he said i i just don't know you haven't given me a number you haven't given me proof as to whatever the level of damages are so you lose on your carmack claim he said but even if you showed me the level of damages in this particular circumstance, because the shipper took responsibility for loading and securing this meat, the exception to the Carmack Amendment kicked in. We were able to show that the driver was not negligent. And so we succeeded in that defense. So it was kind of like a, a double, a double right. defense there. Uh, if your goods are not totally worthless, there is an obligation to mitigate damages. I'll tell you, Tommy, it would be great if I had to go back and, and recreate the facts of this particular case, what I would have absolutely loved is when this happened, if the driver got on the phone with his boss and said, hey boss, this is getting rejected. What do I need to do? What do I need to do? And, and boss gets on the phone or someone gets on the phone with the insurance agent and the insurance agent says, okay, like, get pictures, get the name of the person that the insurance agents actually involved right at the beginning and maybe even able to talk to someone. I don't know. I don't know why you couldn't put the, the insurer on the phone with, with someone at the shipping dock. I'm just wishful thinking here, but you know, hey, we've seen a lot of these and we think that you shouldn't reject this thing. Maybe, you know, do something to take some of them off, off the trailer. What's the state of this? You know, is there any meat on the ground? All of that stuff, you, you can do that there's just nothing stopping you from doing that there's nothing in the law that says don't do that i mean 
I know people don't always want to get involved, but you know, when you're talking about the catastrophic incidents and the stuff that leads to the nuclear verdicts, insurance companies have programs set up so that someone goes immediately to the scene and preserves all the evidence. But I'm dealing with seven, eight hundred thousand dollar cargo claims, and like no one does anything for months uh, sometimes. And and you're like, what? Well, we now know have no idea what happened to the shipment. There's no photographic evidence. There's no inspection. No one's done anything. And we're talking like close to a million bucks. What's going on? And those little things add up so quickly. It's unbelievable. So, you know, I would love to see insurance programs where, where there's some kind of uh, emergency response team, at least on ones that are a little bit larger, or give give information to your carriers that say, hey, this is what you do in an incident like this. Call so-and-so. Talk to us. We'll help you. Um, and the insurer was great in this one. I actually have to say they did get involved as soon as they knew about it and they only knew about it on that secondary rejection rejection because this meat was actually rejected twice all right that's all i have on this case tommy what kind of questions can i answer well, for you i think the important part of it here one other thing that that we preach in the classes we have that for some reason our insurers just really don't buy into it the agents got a hump on this the driver needs to be trained the driver who's hauling food goods needs to be trained to check the temperature, check the load, put, you know, put a uh, load account, do those kind of things to help them here. Because if the driver had been properly trained, it would have made a, a better case for you and maybe got it resolved early enough. Because if they had it inspected, that inspector, because you mentioned things that's unusual here, because obviously at a meat packing house, there's an inspector there. Mm -hmm. could come in and determine what's damaged and what's not. And if there was damage done, the insurance company would have paid for it, or at least had back, going back to the shipper, you come, at least you quantify a number here. Mm -hmm. But we look at the driver's driving record, but we, but we don't really train them well enough to document the things you just said. As I said, we worry about the, the, the liability when we hit somebody, but cargo is such a unique situation and so many moving parts because the car hack. And mm -hmm. because of uh, the involvement of shippers and because you are, quote, absolutely liable, except for the exceptions that you harped on here, that's the, the broker didn't do or the, the shipper and, and the broker on, on behalf of the shipper did not do what the broker, what the shipper had to do to, to prove damages. And that is something was damaged and second, how much it was worth. Mm -hmm. And that would have been the, the the the, um, the part here. The other thing is make sure you read the contracts because, as you know, and and, and we've talked to to you and to Jay a lot about uh, the liability that's passed on to the broker, or, or excuse me, the shipper from the broker, and how many of those contracts can be so pervasive on the on the motor carrier's part of it. Some of them they just want to walk away from. Some sometimes I think uh, don't be so anxious to to pick up a load that you're going to end up having some yeah. problems later. Yeah, and I, I I think you you can say no. Carriers hold a lot of um, economic power at the moment, so to speak, with the lack of capacity, and it is possible to say no. If you're not comfortable with the level of liability that you may be assuming, don't take it. Have a procedure in place for moving past that or try to negotiate it just to make sure there's some kind of, you know, you got you know what the limitations of liability are, and that you have coverage for what you may be responsible for. Um, having SOPs in place to handle these incidents when they happen is so important, Tommy. Training of the driver, I mean, I would have loved if this driver had a lot more training about what to do on the spot. You know, one, look, I'm, I don't wanna cause drivers any trouble because they are so important and they, they have really hard jobs. And one of the difficulties that drivers face is you know, they might take beef one day, they might take something else the next day. They don't always know what they're taking and the procedures might be different for different things. Um, but you do generally know, you know, when you have refrigerated items and there's a reefer problem, got the reefer download right away, all that stuff, like there can be, there can be procedures in place for it. And it's so incredibly helpful for the insurer in the long run. You know, I love it when I see insurance companies and agents giving guidelines to their insureds on what to do not just here's the claim number but here's you know here's a meeting with your drivers that you can have every couple months to go over what to do in the event of an incident and that can save hundreds of thousands of dollars in the long term 
hundreds of thousands. We appreciate you giving us your time today. We appreciate the Taylor Johnson firm for all you do for the foundation. As you know, we've got a long relationship and we look forward to many more of these informative uh, situations where you can give us some real life examples of what happens when something happens to our insurance and how the policy might or might not respond and how we can end up with a better position. Thank you a lot, be safe, and hopefully 2020, 2022 becomes a healthy and successful year. We're out of here. So. Same to you. Thank you, everyone.